Good morning, everybody. We're I'm glad to be here today. It's a blessing to be able to get up here and just talk about God. It's that's a, an amazing thing that, that we can do. It's it's something we should be thankful for. Um, we're in page uh, we're on page sixty in the book. Um, this is uh, more uh, verses from Daniel, and uh, the this lesson is going to be about about prayer, which our last lesson was also made points about prayer. Prayer being uh, a gift from God, the ability to go to God, even being sinful and and being uh, separated from Him by sin, you can't go to Him in prayer because Jesus Christ will mediate for us and and will bridge that gap. He He is the door, He is the way, and He is the way for us to access the Father and the immense power of God just through prayer. But, you know, prayer is not just um, rituals. Prayer is not just saying certain words. It's not a formula or anything like that. What's, prayer is a, a devotional communication with God. And we see that here in, in uh, these uh, verses that we're in in Daniel, how Daniel prays. And we're, we're, we're also so um, lucky to have, blessed to have, verses in the Bible that are... Sample prayers for us. You know, Jesus gives us a sample prayer. He says, pray in this manner. He doesn't say pray this prayer. He says, in this manner. And we have this also in Daniel. If we pray in this manner for ourselves, we'll be doing pretty well. So we're going to look at the verses of Daniel's prayer here for Judah and Israel. We're starting in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 3. And the setting is um, still in Babylon. And our, our lesson is confess wholeheartedly. Confession and repentance keep us close to God. Now, the, the nations uh, of God, the Israel and, and Judah, the people have been captured. They're in captivity still in Babylon. And uh, we're nearing the end of what would be uh, the 70 years since it was pronounced in uh, Jeremiah 25 that God was going to send a judgment on, on Israel and Judah that they were going to go into captivity. It was going to be about 70 years, right? And that's in Jeremiah 25, 11. It says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord. So we have here a promise from God that uh, there will be a response to sin, right, in this situation. And there will be a response to sin. But every time that we see, from the Old Testament to the New, where God is is making His justice known, I will put justice down. And God is a God of justice. He's the God of justice. He will see justice done. But we see every time that God's justice is, is mentioned, also, we see something just as powerful. That is His mercy. His mercy goes right alongside His justice. And that's what He's saying in those two verses there, is that, There will be justice, there will also be mercy. And it's the same for us today. There will be justice if you do not come to God and believe in Jesus Christ. But the fact that we can do that is mercy, is a way to escape the justice that we deserve. So Daniel is praying for the release from captivity in Babylon. You'll notice that Daniel does not sit back on his heels. You know, if you were counting the years down, you've got about two years before the 70 years would be up if you were just counting the years down, right? Now, Daniel does not just say, well, it's just two years. Let's just sit back and wait, right? Because this is not what God pronounces. When God makes a pronouncement like this, 70 years, you look and see what he says is that in 70 years, if you come back to me and you pray that that I come and help you and and take you out of bondage, then I will, right? And and all of God's pronouncements are like this because our God's a God of invitation, we have to participate in the things that he promises or else they don't come to pass. Because all of them are, I will do this for you if you ask me to do it. If you do this you know, first. And, and God is always giving us more than we give to him. right? Just to, go, just to go down in prayer on a knee and have access to all the immense power that God can bring to bear for our, for our problems, for our salvation, for anything that we need. It's, it's an incredible 
imbalance, right? The, the things that I must do to, to access the power of God, it's not much at all, really, compared to the things we do in daily life, all the things we concentrate on day by day. It doesn't, it doesn't even compare. But notice Daniel, when he prays, he prays for the glory of God above all. Even above his needs, the needs of his people, he prays that God be glorified. And his main prayer is a humble prayer. It's a prayer of praise to God. And we have this prayer to help us understand what that, that kind of prayer looks like. So before we get into these verses, well, let's pray and we'll, we'll continue, okay? Lord God, we're so thankful for this day. We're so thankful that we can gather together to read and study your word. And I pray, Father, that uh, whatever is said here today will be something that someone needs to hear, to, to uh, educate, to enlighten, and to uplift, or to, to bring them up out of uh, the bondage of sin, Father. And I ask that you will just uh, have thy Holy Spirit among us today and, and to be our teacher. And whatever we say here, whatever we do here today, let it glorify you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at the first verses here. We're in Daniel chapter 9. We'll start in verse 3. And this is after Daniel has been, has been studying the, the prophecies about the bondage. When he goes to the Lord in prayer, he says in verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession... And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land." So if you look in verse 3, we see that, the, that there's uh, Daniel is making a realization here that, uh, about the face of God. And we see this throughout the Bible. Facing God, being, being, uh, seeing God's face, and also having his face turned away from us. This is a theme that goes throughout because this is something that, that is important to us. When Daniel says, I set my face unto the Lord God, that means he's, he's turning his will toward the things of God. He's turning his will toward God. He's making himself subservient to God. And we see there, then, then he earnestly wishes to seek God's face. And that means to do the things that God asks you to do, the things that he commands you to do. And Daniel seeks God's face the same way that, that you and I can today. It's through prayer, supplication, and repentance. Now, Daniel's commitment to seeking God in this way is, is very impressive because of the time that he's in, right? They're in a very um, trying time, the people that are in bondage, right? And it would be tempting for them at this time to say, well, God abandoned us, so we abandon him, you know, and, and, and try to frame it in some way to give themselves an excuse. Daniel doesn't do that. He approaches God with humility and sincerity. He's got a repentant heart. Right? And we see so many things in, in this prayer of Daniel that can be prayed today. And it's exactly the same. It, it has not changed because the God he's praying to has not changed. We see then that, that Daniel, when he is uh, praying this way, it's a good example for us. Right? We approach God, we should approach God the same way. Humility, with sincerity. To be faithful. And we should seek to obtain righteousness and forgiveness, but we should first seek to glorify God and whatever happens to glorify Him. And we talk about seeking His face, doing the things that He asks, and seeking after God's righteousness and not man's righteousness, which always fails. God's righteousness does not fail. If you look in Psalm 27, 8, this same, uh, this same construction is used. It says, When thou saidst, Seek my face... My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, I will seek. Meaning, do the things that the Lord asks. In Matthew 6, says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we can obtain righteousness by seeking it in Jesus Christ and in God. 
In James 4, 8, it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded. So we're talking about becoming closer to God through prayer by, by expunging sins and, and making ourselves righteous, not by our own power, but by the power of Christ. So Daniel has a plea here for forgiveness of sins, yes, and for the restoration, then, of his people. You see the pattern that he's using. Glorify God asks for forgiveness, then asks God for, he supplicates God for the things that he needs. It's a good order to go in. Right. He emphasizes the importance of repentance also and turning back to God. But this is a confessional prayer where Daniel says, yeah, I have sinned. Even my people have sinned. This is a prayer for all of his people too. And, and the, the, at the very top here is a confession. We have turned away from God's face. God's face will never turn away from you. You will turn away from it by putting in between you and God sin. And God will not, will not uh, turn his face to you while you have sin on you. Daniel, then he acknowledges the people's disobedience and he appeals for God's mercy in this prayer. And he, he talks about God's mercy, his faithfulness, and he talks about the covenant. Right? He says God will always keep his covenants. What does that mean? That means his promises, right? His promise to Abraham is what's being referenced here, but any, any uh, promise that God makes, he will keep. Amen. We see that promises made over and over that those who have turned their way away from God, you can turn right back and just ask forgiveness of him if you're sincere about it. Look in Joel 2 and 12. It says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Deuteronomy 7.9 says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So our God is a God of mercy, Amen. but a God who also keeps his promises. And God refers, or Daniel refers to God as... Um, in verse 4 there, as great and dreadful. And as reverence and awe to God. An acknowledgement of God's immense power and holiness, right? Uh, dreadful is something that we have sort of changed the meaning of the words today, but dreadful just means worthy of awe. It's the same as fearing God. It means to give God the respect that he deserves, the respect that he is due, and the glory that he is due. Acknowledge his power, acknowledge his holiness. We see that in Psalm 111, 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Talking about the nature of God. And Nehemiah 1.5 goes further and says this, And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. So what, uh, what is the, the, one of the greatest things that makes God so great to us is that he does keep his, keep his promises, right? But also that he is merciful. And this is what Daniel is talking about here. God has faithfulness toward his promises. He has mercy to those who obey him. And we give thanks to him for that. Because his mercy is so powerful. His mercy is such a defining characteristic of God. You cannot separate God from mercy. Mercy flows out of him. You see in Psalm 136.1, says, Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Right? So we know that God goes on forever. We see here then mercy goes on forever. So they go on together because he is one and the same. He is mercy. And we wouldn't know what mercy is without him. We wouldn't be capable of mercy being, being in his image unless we were formed in his image to be able to have the kind of mercy that he has but not the extent of mercy that he has. We'll never attain that. If you look in verse 5, there's a, a further admission. It says, we have sinned and committed iniquity. Right And there's the first part. This is a prayer of confession. We have sinned and have committed iniquity. So he confesses both his sin and the sin of his people, but he confesses it. And we should do the same. We should pray for, for yourself. Yeah, sure. Pray for others. Yeah, of course. Pray for the whole world. Pray for humanity. Pray for the masses of lost. You don't know their names, but That's you can right. still pray for them. God knows all their names. That's right. And we know that there are, 
There is no difference between me and a person who is lost except that by grace, Jesus Christ saved me. By grace, I was drawn, and by grace, I was saved, and by grace only, I've been saved up out of that lost situation. But there are a lot of people who have not come and done that yet. Whether it's for whatever reason it's for, they are all in that fallen state, because we are all in that fallen state. It's in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes Daniel, right? We've been studying Daniel, how all the things that he did right, all the things that he was righteous about, all the things that he did that were good, and things that are good examples for us. You know, he, he, God rescued him out of the den of lions because he was, he was so faithful to God. Yet here is Daniel, this man supremely faithful, saying, no, I'm just, a, I'm just a raggedy old sinner, same as anybody else. And it's the case. Daniel does not come to God by his own righteousness. He comes to God because of God's mercy. And that's what he's saying here. You know, even I, even Daniel, even this, this paragon, and we should, we should look to Daniel as a great example, but Daniel also confesses, yes, I am also a sinner, also in a broken state, and I need God. Right. It's in Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. That includes Daniel. That includes Abraham. That includes everybody except Jesus Christ. He has done that. And rebellion is a serious offense, right? We read through that and we think rebellion and go on. But rebellion is a very serious thing. That's a rejection of God's authority. That's a questioning of God's power, and it grieves God when we rebel against him, whether when we're saved especially and we rebel against him, it gives him grief. And look in 1 Samuel 15 and 23, it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee. So we see here there's an equivalent being made in 1 Samuel there. Rebellion, witchcraft, being stubborn and mean to people, all the same thing, right? And we, we right. tend to... We tend to try to avoid witchcraft, don't we? Right. We avoid being mean and, and, and nasty to people, don't we? But do we avoid rebelling from God and not doing His commandments and, and, and day by day following Him? It's just as bad a thing, right? And Isaiah 1-2 says the same thing. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. For those of you who have kids... You know, when they rebel against you, if they rebel against you, it can cause you a lot of heartache, can it? But you don't stop loving them, but they can rebel, and it can cause you pain. You get a little bit, a very tiny bit of what God feels when we rebel against Him as His children. Then uh, when you look at verse 6 there, at the end of this, uh, this part, it says, Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So Daniel admits, for the people, we have not listened to God's word. We haven't listened to what God has had to say, and God's word is delivered through his prophets. And the prophets spoke the voice of God to the people. And, and being God's Word God from God Himself, it should have been obeyed, right? We have that today. We have the words from prophets. We have the words from holy men of God to instruct us. These are words from God, inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to us from God. So we, like Daniel was talking about for Judah, we have no excuse. We have no excuse to say, well, I didn't know. I mean, look how, look how thick it is, all of this instruction we have. Right? And mine's not even the big margin or the, the giant text. But we, when we, we have all of this as a gift from God, and we're talking about this, um, Daniel is highlighting for us the importance of listening to God, listening to his word, right? Not only when we are drawn by God and we become... A child of God, we don't stop listening to God and doing His will. That's when we actually start doing it in earnest. And the, you see in Luke eleven twenty eight 28, says, uh, He said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Right? Notice there are two parts. Hear it and keep it. Hearing it will do you some good, but if you don't do it, 
It's pretty hollow, right? right. It's a clanging cymbal, Paul said. It's just noise. And James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So if we hear what is right, or if we read what is right, but we don't do it, we reject God's power and his, his authority by not doing it, just sitting and listening and forgetting it the next day, or reading through it and not studying it, and just you know trying to power through. I was talking to somebody the other day, like, trying to power through the Bible and just say, I read it all. That doesn't do you any good. Right. You've got to read and study it. And however long it takes you is how long it takes you, as right. long as you're studying it in earnest. And that's what it is to be a hearer and a doer. That you hear the word, or you read the word, and you do what it says, not just read it. And they have then Daniel is talking about how the people of Israel, they ignored the prophets. And this, these are people sent from God, sent to them, and you see in 2 Chronicles 36, 16, it says, They mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Part of the situation that they're in, and a lot of the situations we'll get in, is they didn't listen to God. They didn't trust God. They didn't do the things that God wanted them to do. And that is laid out clearly for us, right? And it was laid out clearly for them through the prophets they had living prophets to come to and say, well, can you tell me again what God said? And the prophet would be able to tell them. They still didn't do it. In fact, it says they mocked the prophets. They killed the prophets. They persecuted the prophets. And Jeremiah 25, 4 says, And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. It talks about all the work of people that people had done to bring the word of God to these people. And all the work and persecution that has gone into making this written word of God for us is something we should respect also. That a, lot of, a lot of hardship and trials, deaths to bring this to us today. And this, this is not something we should forget. And that's why disobedience and ignorance of the messages that we have from God through the prophets, through the Bible, it leads to consequences. Big consequences that we bring on ourselves. The disastrous results of not listening to God. If you look in Proverbs 124, God talks about this. He says, Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Now, this could be talking about you, know, you and I when we just don't do the things that God needs us to do, that God desires us to do, the things that God commands us to do. We can suffer consequences, right? right. We're told that, that God's a loving Father, and so He will, uh, he will uh, punish you. If, if you're a child, that's what a loving father does, is teaches and chastises a child until they do right, to teach them what is right. But we see also here that this is, this is God is saying exactly then what he says now to the lost person. Hey, you have mocked the people that brought you the gospel. You have despised the words of the gospel and not listened. You have misused people that have brought you the gospel. But now... The wrath of the Lord will be against you, and there will be no remedy for you. Because in the gospel is where you, you hear about Jesus Christ. You hear about God's mercy. And if you ignore God's mercy, you cannot escape his justice and his wrath. So God is talking about this. This is the same now it is as it is then. There will be people in the last day who have mocked God, mocked his messengers, mocked his message, despised his words, and misused his prophets. Misused his saints. And the wrath of the Lord will be against them. And God says there that there will be no remedy in that day. The remedy will have passed by. And Jeremiah 25, 4 again says this, And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants the prophets, rising early and sending them. You have not hearkened, he says in Jeremiah. You have not hearkened. And this is God being, <laughs> being grieved by this, that, that people had not listened. And Israel, God has always said, you know, Israel, uh, he, he tried and tried to, to work, work with Israel, to, to make Israel a great nation, but they always will turn aside. They always will turn aside to idolatry. They always turn aside to, to their own uh, selfish desires. And God says, well, then if, if you turn away from me, where all good things come from, you're going to go into a lot of bad things. So disobedience and ignorance of these divine messages, divine messages lead to dire consequences, right? And 
And when, when you're reading and studying your Bible here, remember, this is a divine message, an expression from God. Right? And when we say an expression from God, right, this is, this is the God who sits on high. This is the God who created all things. This is God who controls all things. In whose hand thy breath is, they said in that last lesson that I taught to um, Belshazzar, this is from him. So how can we not give it the authority, the, the honor it deserves, and follow the things that it says? But we don't. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you got to make yourself strong, right? You can't be weak. That's right. Yeah, all that all that we're asked to do is go and share it. Go and share it, and it's already written out for us. It's already prepared. Everything that's in here, as long as we've studied it up, you'll have something to say. God opens the mouths of people who don't have things to say. It's, I'm staying here right now because of that. And you, let's look at the next section. It's in 7 through 10. Does anybody else want to say anything before we go to this next one? So Daniel 9, 7 through 10. We're going to move on to Daniel talking about God's righteousness, but also what his justice looks like. And, and, and again, you can look at this as part of, um, this would be part of the prayer of any, any sinner today who needs the God's forgiveness who needs God to turn his face back toward him. So look at Daniel 9, 7. It says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. If you look in verse 7, Daniel acknowledges God, God's righteousness. This is, this is part of God that cannot be separated from God, that he is righteous. And we see that throughout. Psalm 116, 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Righteousness is something that is recognized throughout the Bible. This is what God is. He is Amen. righteousness. And this is why we seek him, because we should seek righteousness. Because the fruits of righteousness are good things for us spiritually. And when we are without that... We are hungry for righteousness. We are, right. We're starving. We're anorexic, like Brother Jeff was saying. The shame and confusion that the Israelites are experiencing right now, he acknowledges this is because of disobedience. And he says the, the, the confusion of faces that, that, that we deserve, right? And the, that is the wages of sin, is this confusion, is death, is, is not knowing what to do day by day, not having any compass, any spiritual compass in the world. And uh, Jeremiah 3.25 talks about this too. We lie down in our shame and our confusion covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God. That is where the confusion comes from. It's when we, when we do not trust God, when we do not do the things that God commands, there'll be confusion. You'll be confused. You won't know what to do. You won't know where to go. And the consequences then of this are, uh, are dire, because this is one of the things that where we see this word trespass, right? Trespass against thee, he says, talking about trespass against God, and that is, that, that is sin. A trespass against God is sin, not doing the things of God. And when, when God, Daniel confesses this, he's confessing sins for the people of Israel. That includes its leaders, its ancestors, all of, all of the fathers. None of them were perfect. 
And he says in Isaiah 59 too, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And I think that verse especially goes good with this because it does lay it right out uh, in exactly the way that it happens. Your iniquities have separated you from God. Right. right? And it will be in the last day, God is not going to throw anybody out except people who have willingly divided themselves from him through sin and not sought the redemption that he offers through Jesus Christ. That will be how you go into the lake of fire, is that you, you, you refuse to, to be joined to God. Right. You let that separation remain. And that is everybody. There is nobody that is perfect. You see in Romans 3.23, we know this, for all have sinned and come short. And James 4.17 talks about sin as well in that same way. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And how do we know to do good? We listen to the prophets and we, listen, we read the word of God. That's how you know what is good. And that's how you know what you've got to do. What is, a, what is a violation of that? So that's in the verse 8, the confusion of faith. And he talks about, this is interesting, he talks about uh, forgiveness and coming to God and, and admitting, confessing, not just his own sins, but that he is in a, in a nation that is sinful. That he is in a, in a world that is sinful, and that he is among a people that have been that have sinned against God and earned His wrath. You can do that today if you if you uh, understand that that your nation is a sinful nation and is being uh, judged by God. You can pray for your nation. In fact, you've got to pray for your nation that God will lift us up out of, of whatever problems that we're in. Daniel recognizes that it all comes from sins that have been committed by God by by individuals. By na the nation itself, a nation can sin against God, and God will punish that nation, bring judgment upon that nation. If you look in verse nine, he turns back and talks about goes from from talking about the nature of man, unrighteous, not willing to listen, to the nature of God again, mercy and forgiveness. Although we have rebelled, there's a rebellion again. So what do we do then when we are in this this simple rebellious condition? We realize then that mercy belongs to the Lord, that he shows his loving kindness even despite rebellion, right? If we rebelled against God and he executed his wrath and justice upon all of us and that was it, he's perfectly justified in doing that, right? But the nature of God is mercy, so God is not satisfied with that. God gives us a way out, gives us the door, gives us the way to life. And it's in Psalm 103, 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. So you see again, mercy is part of him. Mercy is God. God is mercy. And Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It is the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Right? We would be consumed, wouldn't we, without the mercy of God expressed through Jesus Christ on coming to earth. We would be consumed in the lake of fire with all the others who, who refuse him. But that's not the nature of God. God gives us a way because he is forgiving. And that's how he proves his greatness. That's how he manifests his greatness on the world is through his mercy. His willingness to pardon sins even for, even for those who do the very worst things we can think of. You can repent to God and he will forgive it. And that's why he deserves such worship and praise and faith and love is because we can be saved because he is merciful. You look in Psalm 134, it says, But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. That is why God is great. This is why we fear him. Not because we fear that he's going to you know, sweep us away, but because he is so merciful, powerful, and loving that we're, we're in awe of it. Right? It's right. amazing. And he is faithful and just to forgive sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness in 1 John 1 and 9. But despite God's mercy and forgiveness, Daniel here, he's saying that, that I've got to acknowledge that we have first, first acknowledge that we have rebelled and sinned, right? We can't ask forgiveness if we do not first confess and, and realize I'm in a sinful state and I need help. This is the conviction of the lost person. I'm in a sinful state, there's, there's something wrong and I need help. Daniel acknowledges this, and he has a call then at the end to return to God in verse 9. He acknowledges God's mercy and God's forgiveness, even in the face of rebellion. And God is willing, God promises that if we do that, if we do repent, that he will listen. 
you look in Acts 3.19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So where does this, where does this blotting out of sin come from? From the presence of the Lord. It doesn't come from anywhere else. There's no man that can pardon you. There's no amount of money that can pardon you. There's no church that can pardon you. There's no, there's no uh, teacher here. There's no pastor. There's no individual anywhere on earth that can pardon you. It all comes from God. There was only one man who walked the earth who can give pardon. That's Christ through the Father. If you look in verse 10, it says, Neither have we obeyed the voice to walk in his laws, which he set for us by his servants, the prophets. Once again, talking about the prophets, giving clear instructions through the prophets that they didn't obey. And God provided his laws to his people through his prophets, again. And that was an important role in communicating his will through the prophets. But again, they did not listen. And God responded to that. If you look in Deuteronomy 28, 15, it says, It shall come to pass if thou wilt... Look, there's an if here. If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, so there's the first part, if you don't listen, if you don't read, if you don't study, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, what I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. It will happen. This is the nature of God's promise. You will be overtaken by sin. Sin will own you, and Satan will be your father up to the end of your days, and then he will have you. That's right. right? But God, again, God of invitation, says before that, if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord, right? And every time that the Bible says something is not true, you, you, you can look at the opposite way and see doing, doing this this way is going to be different. So when he says, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, the curse of sin shall come upon you and have you. Okay, do we know the opposite is also true then, don't we? If you will hearken to the voice of the Lord, and, and you will observe to do all his commandments, which he commanded thee this day, these curses shall not come on you. These curses will not overtake you. These curses will have no power over you. And that's the promise. All of God's promises have that. And God's promises... Don't go away. They don't fade away. So that is the same truth today for everybody in the world, every sinner in the world. If you will hearken to the voice of the Lord, right? We have the Holy Spirit that draws us. That is from the Lord. To observe to do all His commandments and His statutes. His commandments and statutes are, come to me to repentance, <laughs> right? Uh, and then all these curses will not come upon you. Sin will not have any hold over you. Sin will not be able to, to even touch you. But if we don't do that, Galatians 6, 7 tells us what happens then. Because again, this is still a promise if you don't do it. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Amen. So what we have sown in sin, we will reap in judgment. Unless someone reaps it for us. And that's Jesus Christ. Who has been the reaper for for my sins and my transgressions, all the, all the wrath that was due me, he has taken. If you look in the, the last section, we skip over to Daniel 9, 17 through 19. And this is Daniel concluding his prayer here. If you look in Daniel 9, 17, it says, Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So Daniel is making these prayers to God. He's calling on God's mercy, asking him to restore the sanctuary of God, restore the temple, but also restore uh, all of the things that Israel had because when they followed God and were blessed because of it. He wants all of that restored. And, it, and you can only ask that, as Daniel does, if you believe God's ability and his willingness to do that, to show mercy and to restore back the things that sin has destroyed. And Psalm 51.1 talks about this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. And this, this again, uh, 
specifically says, it's, it's, not, it's not anything that I've done, right? It's thy forgiveness, thy loving kindness, thy, thy tender mercies, not, not anything that I can do. But it's only because God is merciful. And the sanctuary he's referring to, of course, the temple, which was desolate at this time. Remember we talked about how Belshazzar had taken all the holy relics and had a, had a party and consecrated them to these idols. And it was a great crime because when the temple is restored... These things are going to go back to it. That's what God has, has uh, told us is going to happen and told the Israelites was going to happen. And it does happen. And the plea for the righteousness is, is not for our sake. It's not because we can do anything about it. He says, for the Lord's sake. Because this is, this is what you are, he's saying to God. This is, we understand this is what you are. This is how you work. We see your promises and we believe this is our God and what he is. And it says in Ezekiel 36, 22, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither you went. So God does things, he does them for his glory and for our good, and they go together. But things that glorify God, they, they lift us up. And 1 John 2.12 says it again, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. For when you see it for his sake, for his name's sake, it means because of who he is. That's what they're saying in these verses. Because of who you are, God, your name's sake, all of this can happen. Because of your mercies, all this can happen. Because you are so kind, forgiving, and just, all of this can happen. In verse 18, God, Daniel is calling on God, hear and see the plight of the people. And he acknowledges then something else that is wonderful, that God is attentive to the prayers of his people. God listens. Look in Psalm 34, 15, says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. And 1 Peter 3, 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Just saying the same thing again. And those who are presenting supplications based on you know, their own righteousness... That's not going to work. The hope is not in our own righteousness, but in the mercies of God. We have complete dependence on God's mercy. I cannot be merciful to myself and forgive myself. It doesn't work that way. I haven't sinned against myself. But Daniel mentions the city called by God's name, and that's Jerusalem. And that's, that's because he understands the significance of Jerusalem. It's linked to God's reputation among the pagan peoples. What Jerusalem does, people are watching. It's the same for you and me. What the church does, people are watching. What you do as a, as a child of God, people are watching. And Jerusalem is a Hebrew word. It, it comes from yire, which is God provides. And shalem, or shalom, which means peace. God provides peace is the name of his holy city. That's why Daniel says, it's your name. Because God provides peace is who you are. And he's right. Finally, verse 19, Daniel, he, he does a plea for God to hear, hear his prayer and forgive and appeal to God to listen and to respond. Right Now, Daniel does not prescribe how God will respond. He just asks God, respond. That's a good lesson for us. Let's not, let's not pray and, and try to direct God how he will answer these prayers. Just say to him, I need, I need your help. I need your help in this. And, and let God help you how he will help you. And if you look at, finally at, the, at, at all of this that Daniel does, we see an answer to a question, how does God answer a prayer of a humble person? A, a confessional prayer. When the prayer is confessional, when it's faithful, when it's humble, when it seeks forgiveness earnestly and recognizes God's glory and power, well, how does he answer it? It's in Daniel, if you look in 6.21, it says, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. So, Gabriel comes to him from the throne of God, bearing a message from God that says, as soon as you started asking me, I started working on it. I sent my angel out to help you. And as soon as your, command, your supplications came, he commanded his angel. 
And what message did the angel bring? Well, he brought interpretation of dreams and things, but the main thing that the angel says, the first thing that Gabriel says from God to this man who confessing sins, saying what a wretched state he's in, what a wretched state his nation is in, what's the first message that God brings to him? Thou art greatly beloved. A message of love to those who do not deserve God's love, and that is who God is. And I think that's the, the best thing we can learn from this prayer of Daniel is God responds with love even to the prayer of a sinner, even to the prayer of one who, who is, has gone so far from him that it's, it's hard to come back. And I've been there, and God won't answer that prayer. He will not turn his face away from a prayer that asks for forgiveness. Let's pray, and we'll, we'll end there. Lord God, we thank you so much again for this day. We thank you for the ability to read and study your word. And I pray, Father, that some understanding has come to me, that some understanding has come to the rest of us here in this church today. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon the rest of the service. We ask for your blessing upon Brother Bill, that you keep him uplifted and strong and inspired to, to preach your word, exactly the word that we need to hear. We ask, Father, that you will uplift also our, our song leaders so that we can praise you in song as you so richly deserve. And as we leave today, I hope that we can all just celebrate being able to come before you in your house, to be able to pray to you day by day for whatever we need, and to understand, Father, that, that we have nothing by our right. All that we have comes from your grace and flows out from your throne. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you.